Hi, I'm Cora, and welcome to my podcast, Filmmaking, Actually. Ta-da! <laughs> um, so I wanted to record a little intro, because as you may or may not know, we have a Patreon, and we do lots of things there, including having monthly Zoom workshops. The first one we did, we had a bunch of really awesome festival directors who gave kind of some inside baseball to uh, the world of festivals, festival selection, and all that stuff. Our last workshop was with some really amazing writers who I'm very excited to share with you. And while I will always keep this podcast free, it does take a lot of work to do it. You know, the episodes get written and recorded and mixed and edited and put out and promoted. Um, it's, it's a lot. Um, and just the, the work of organizing everything. What we are doing is I am sharing pieces from the Patreon workshops. If you would like to access the entire thing, it's literally $1.99 to be uh, one of our patrons. We're trying to make this as accessible as possible while continuing our own viability. The full, full panel is there as a recorded video on Patreon. At the same time, these writers gave some really amazing information, and I never like the idea of knowledge being held behind a paywall. I don't think that's fair. So we are actually going to be sharing two parts for this episode, and it's going to be pretty much the entire panel. There was a part at the beginning where we reviewed some submitted log lines. That part is Patreon only, but everything else, the moderated Q&A, the discussion, all of their information, everything is here for you in this podcast for free. (laughs) If you like what you hear here, if you want to support what we're doing, you can head over to Patreon. Spacey will give the information for that and it'll be in the link below. You can go ahead and support us there. We have various tiers. Every tier gets the same access. We just want to keep being able to do what we do for you. So yeah, check us out there. Check us out here. Enjoy the podcast and I hope you learned something actually. <laughs> okay, here it is. Hi, my name's Cora. Um, I'm the president of Space Dream Productions, and um, we're putting on this panel today kind of as part of our Patreon, but also because we want to start doing as much as we can to support other filmmakers and people in the artistic communities. Joining me today are some fantastic writers. If I was smart, I would have made you remind me how to pronounce your last name, Monique, because I love you to death and my brain <laughs> refuses to remember. <laughs> It's okay. It's all right. Um, you, could so, say, you could say my first name and then I'll say my last name. How about that? Okay. Okay. Perfect. So um, joining us today is the fantastic writer Monique. And Padre, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's a former executive assistant to Ms. Barbara Streisand, a seasoned producer and award-winning director. She's the writer of Turkey's Done, starring Saturday Night Live's Sherry Otieri. Uh, next to her, we have the wonderful... Refuse to give me a more detailed bio. <laughs> I refuse. What are these words? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, the amazing Nick Gambino. He is one of the partners here at Space Dream Productions. He's also the original writer of Names on the Wall, which is currently streaming on Amazon Prime. He's an associate producer for story development of the vast majority of all of Space Dream Productions films since 2013. Um, next up is Sarah Daly. Some of you may know her as the Marvelous Metaphorist. She's the writer of the Morgan M. Morganson series, including Morgan M. Morganson's Date with Destiny, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Channing Tatum. She's also the writer of Lord of Tears and the Unkindness of Ravens, for you horror fans out there. And next is one of my personal heroes, Nora Baskin. She's a (laughs) phenomenal young adult author, creative writing teacher, multi-award winning author of 15 novels for young adult readers, including 910, A September 11 Story, Anything But Typical, and Ruby on the Outside, along with several personal narrative essays. So I just wanted to thank the panel and thank you guys all for being here. Thank Um, you. Thank you. And there's a little, a little this feature that uh, (laughs) you're very excited. Okay, awesome. So there you go. (laughs) That's not me this time. (laughs) So um, I'm going to jump ahead into some kind of gist of genres uh, really quickly. Uh, There's a really great masterclass on masterclass uh, by a a little known writer named Neil Gaiman. Um, And uh, he talks about writing for genre. 
one thing that I see a lot in the scripts that I read is that balance between genre and then getting very tropey and kind of trite beyond an interesting story within a genre. Neil's advice was to find things that were very specific that make it the genre. Like um, he talked about a story about a young girl with skin as white as snow and lips as red as blood and hair as dark as night. And he was like, I mean, clearly that's a vampire. So <laughs> he like... Or me. Right? <laughs> or you. <laughs> um, so he like reimagined Snow White as this like vampire story and how she's sleeping during the day and like this whole thing. So um, I always thought it was really interesting and I wanted to kind of, I was like, oh, we could explore that with the panel. And Sarah, we can totally start with you because you are the, the resident horror. Um, but you also write really brilliant fantasy and drama. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Space, you just said, did you just say she's the resident horror? <laughs> you did. You did, I mean, whatever. You did say that. <laughs> I meant resident horror writer. See, words are important. You got to make sure you use all the words. Um, I was just making an example. So maybe you can speak to that kind of how do you hit those horror buttons? We can kind of go through the panel. Um, Monique, you write everything from like, a Philadelphia-based drama to a very, very specific Christmas story. And they're all, you know, unique. And Nick, you pretty much write literally anything, and I still don't understand how. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Nora, you take real-life experiences and write these beautiful, moving and powerful memoir pieces. So maybe we can start with Sarah, just because horror is such like a genre genre, and then kind of move through the virtual room. Does that work for you guys? Sure. Cool. All right, Sarah, you're on. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the, the crux of the question is how do you fulfill a genre without descending into cliche or tropes? Um, and I would say people are too scared of cliche. Like cliche is cliche for a reason. There's certain things that people want in a horror story. Um, mm -hmm. And if you if you're actively fighting against your genre too much, then you're not going to tell a good story that is effective or satisfying. Um, so for me, I would say don't be afraid of cliche. But yes, you want to hit certain buttons, um, but you also want to do everything you can to make your story original. And you do that with the setting, with your message, with your characters. Um, these, are the, these are the ways that you give your story its own soul and its own color. Um, how you set it apart, how you make it original, how you make it different, how you don't feel like you're just painting by numbers. But there are certain points that you want to hit. Like if it's a horror film, people expect some level of scares. It doesn't have to have jump scares necessarily. I'm not a big fan of those, but you should have moments that are genuinely terrifying and memorable. Um, very often you want to have a monster or you know, people going to places where you feel like they really shouldn't be going if they had any sense. Um, but people will, will forgive these cliches, but they won't forgive you not giving them what they want in a horror story, which is to be scared. And there are certain things that make people scared and you kind of have to use those devices if you're going to create uh, a story that's satisfying. Um, so I would say, yeah, don't be afraid of cliche, but if you're going to use tropes, then put your own spin on them. There's always a way to to make them your own. Hundred percent. Yeah, and um, and I think that's kind of the the crux of it is it's one thing to just kind of cut and paste some sort of template, and another thing to be like, okay, well, horror means jump stairs or scary things or the beautiful woman running up the stairs instead of out the front door like she should. Um, but <laughs> figuring out how or why, like what maybe something makes her go upstairs that isn't just She's an idiot. Um, like, yeah, you always you always want to feel like characters are acting in a way that is motivated, um, that feels authentic. Um, yeah. So so yeah, you always want to want to make sure that the reason that they go to the scary place is a really good one. But at the same time, people will overlook some lapses in <laughs> judgment if you're entertaining slash scaring them and giving them what they want. But yeah, you, you always strive to, to create something that feels real and motivated and, and authentic. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then in the completely other spectrum of drama and Christmas, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Monique, how do you kind of like stay within a genre? Cause that, 
I, I realized I missed this note. Um, one thing that Neil Gaiman said in his class is that you have to check the boxes. It's just how do you check those boxes? So Monique, how do you kind of really nail those genre pieces while still telling an interesting story? You know, we, we were kind of talking the other day about like creating a world with Turkey's Down, I created this world within these very big and larger than life Philly characters. Like the, a character was Philly. Um, so they're bigger than life and that's what they were. And that's what you saw on the screen in, in my short. And, and same thing, obviously, when I wrote this Christmas film, it's like people are watching Christmas films because they want it all, you know, to work out in the end and it's Christmas and but finding different ways to obviously show different things about Christmas, right? And things that actually mean something to not only your characters, but everyone else too, like traditions and uh, bringing, you know, specific traditions, like where I come from, like from, I'm, I'm Italian, obviously. So tradition means a lot to me. So you'll see a lot of that throughout my films and, and my writing. And I find that, you know, obviously, what we were told in the very beginning as writers is write what you know. I still do my best to keep that in the back of my head the whole time um, while showing these worlds to the audience in which either I come from or these traditions that, you know, still hold true either within my neighborhood or my family, both for Turkey's Done and, and Christmas. Like Sarah said, with, with horror, it's the same thing. It's you, you know what you're going to get when you're watching these genres, right? So you do want to give it to your audience, but again, staying true to yourself obviously comes through to your characters. So doing your best to do that as well, while making it interesting somehow, some way. <laughs> um, and speaking of staying true to yourself, Nora, so many of your stories are either directly self-inspired or from personal experiences. Um, so many of your essays and blog posts are memoir um, and the class that you teach um, is, well, you know, it can be used for creative writing. A lot of it is largely memoir writing. What would you say for, if you're gonna dive into a memoir experience, how do you kind of hold that while still, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I want to answer that. I love it, but you know, as as you guys are talking, like Sarah, I, I, I'm thinking, are we allowed to like say a little bad word here? <laughs> or, I love it. <laughs> Please do. Okay, okay, because I'm thinking there's only like I'm listening to Sarah. You're so right. It, it, you know, it's you tell a good story, and people do. All right. So in in terms of writing from your own life you still have to follow the rules of storytelling. There are just certain rules and, and Sarah's calling them what on tropes or um, I forgot the, the things people expect, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there, but we do. So there has to be a journey. There has to be beginning, middle and end. There has to be a conflict. There has to be resolution. There has to be a, a, so what I call it the, so what, like, you know, it's your life, but so what and, you know, everyone has a life. How do you tell a story? So I was thinking the only genre there is, is shit happens, you know, and every, all of us, it's just, you tell a good story. And the only things I would say in terms of writing from your own life, there are like pitfalls, setting it in your childhood era, the 1970s or 80s, just because it's nostalgic for you. That's not the story you're telling, unless it's very crucial. Like I did set a story in 2001 because it was about 9-11, but otherwise, um, you know, you don't want to be self-indulgent. You don't want to be, you don't want to look for pity for your story. A lot of people write their stories because they want people to feel sorry for them. There are so many things people do when they think they have a story about their life. And the key thing is to find out what is the story you want to tell, not really care if anybody else is going to be interested in it because if you're interested in it, it will be interesting if you follow, like Sarah said, the what what do we call, call them? Rules, um, devices. Yeah, like just this the structure of telling a story, and however you warp it around or, or mix it up, there are things people want. It they want conflict. They want to, uh, you know, they want something right up front. They need to find out. They want a, something to keep them reading or watching, and. Um, you have to give up, you have to be very humble when you're writing from your own life. And um, I'll end with this. You have to be willing to throw your characters under the bus 
especially yourself. And that might be the hardest thing to do. But if you're not brave enough to do that, it's going to it's gonna feel trite and right. um, self-indulgent. Like uh, let go of your ego. Yes. Yeah. And really right. dig deep. Oh, um, I got a little uh, clap. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that was basic. There you go. No, it was a bunch of people. And I should be clear, obviously, when I say avoiding trope, I don't mean like you know what's that movie memento where they like threw the script down the steps and then just picked it up and that became the movie <laughs> like, <laughs> parts, yeah yeah they just like threw it and they're like great here's our story like obviously you know you need some like there has to be the pieces but like you said sarah making sure that the characters are driven in a reason like um <laughs> uh, it's not just you're not writing it because it's a horror therefore i have to x but you're you're doing it in a way that tells a story where the the story is king and then the yes. the genre is supporting the story yeah. um so nick speaking of uh king um you write across <laughs> you write across so many genres. i mean you wrote the you co-wrote nine tenths of the law with me and it's about these two women in their 60s in new york these two jewish women whose mother was a holocaust survivor and you know you did a pass and i was supposed to do a pass as a jewish woman but some of the dialogue that you wrote for these women was so perfect <laughs> you know we just left it like you really nailed that genre um even though someone could argue you know, it isn't knowing thyself. You clearly are not a Jewish woman whose mother survived the Holocaust. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I mean, like that? yeah, I mean, I would say the uh, three writers here pretty much said everything perfectly. Um, I'd just be piggybacking off of what they're saying. But uh, I mean, Sarah, you were talking about cliche. Uh, that's something I say a lot, like cliche is cliche for a reason, because it's true and it's real. Mm -hmm. And there are genre beats that you have to follow. If you want to write a spy thriller, where there are yes. neither spies nor anyone being thrilled, like, what's the point? Um, but within, that's just like more of a framework, but then within the framework, you can create art, you can do things that are different. And I think one of the things I try to do as much as possible, whether or not I succeed, but everything I do, I, I read it over like 10,000 times to say, is this different enough? Is this something that I've seen or I'm just pulling from the 20,000 movies I've seen, or I, I know that this beat even go, comes down to dialogue. I think we all do this in at, at least a first draft where you're like, I just said something that's the most cliche sentence. Like that dialogue <laughs> has been heard like a million times. And I just put it in there like without even thinking, thinking, oh yeah, this is all coming from my head, but it's coming from like memory of things I've watched or read and that's how it's supposed to sound. So you'll go through and start to weed that stuff out and be like, well, this could be different. Now it doesn't mean you need to reinvent the wheel every time on every movie and change it. It has to be like, you know, Andy Warhol sleeping like two hours of somebody sleeping because it's art. But, you know, I think I think it's just a matter of, you know, you have your framework and within that you could do so much. And I think just try to do something that, you know, maybe it's a little familiar, but it also different. And that different is you. That's you. You're the most different thing about that story is you. And you're going to just put that in it. And um, yeah, it takes rewriting and you find that more in the rewrite, I think. Yeah. Up front. Yeah. I, I had an editor before I was published say I she was asking me, you know, what ideas I had, what other ideas she wound up not publishing me, but that's another story. But she said to me, What well, you know, do you have any other ideas? And I, I said, Well, yeah, I I always wanted to write a story about my, my mother's suicide and growing up without a mother. And I said, But but that's already been done. Every book on the shelf is a dead mother, a dead father, both dead parents, you know, sort of, and she said, This changed my life. She said, But nobody can tell your story. Right. And so, yeah, it's a cliche. It's been done a million times, but but it's like you said, you add it's your art. You add your it's your voice. It's your fingerprint. And every story's already been told. Shakespeare right. in the Bible, yeah. you know. So, just it's just your voice. That's all that you're gonna have. Right. Yeah. I think it's it's really interesting. Um, I think Nora, you said like take your ego out of it. Yeah. You know, because I wrote originally this Christmas story as a male and a female lead. And it was suggested to me from the film company that I'm working with that, why don't we make it um, a female, female Christmas story? And I was like, okay. And they were like, but that's so much closer to who you are as a person. And that's going to come out on the page without you even trying. And I didn't even think about that in a million years. So it's, it is taking 
it's kind of a step back sometimes and looking at your ha characters. And I'll, all I really had to do was change pronouns and character names. And it was right. the same exact story, but so much more interesting and everyone agreed and the person who actually suggested it is not gay at all. And I was completely shocked. Um, and it's, it's a much better, interesting story. And, you know, taking my own ego out of it, maybe I was hiding behind it the whole time. Um, wow. Yeah. So that really hit hard to me that you said that. So well, pretty cool. Thank That's you. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, we've done that a couple of times in scripts where you just, you don't touch the dialogue. You don't touch anything. You just take the pronouns and flip them and the names and flip them. And I remember one script we were going through and we were like reworking it and reworking it and everything else was pretty much in place. But this one character was just so boring. And I was like, why don't I like this guy? Like, there's just nothing interesting about him. And Spacey goes, remember when the first draft, he was a woman. And I was like, oh, like the way I didn't write the first draft, but in the first draft of that script, it was originally a female character. We didn't change the dialogue. We just flipped the gender. And now we're like, this is like the most boring man ever. And it was a boring female character and it became a boring male character and it just stood out more. So that's that's also a great way to to kind of find the weak spots, even if it's just for a reread. Flip the genders around and read your characters and see how does this play. Flip relationship statuses around. That's just something that um, I found where it's like, oh, well, what if um, Spacey just wrote a short uh, sci-fi piece and it's uh, originally it was a woman and we just flipped it to a man and now um, did you want to say something about this as he pops onto the stage? No, I just wanted to say hi. Oh, hi. Um, uh, and now, you know, it's a guy wearing this pink fuzzy sweater and struggling with this birthday cake as he's trying to make his way through the door. And it's just such a different character. And there's nothing about him that's like effeminate or weak or, or like trite or cliche, quote unquote. It's just suddenly this very quirky man that had been written as a woman and then we just flipped it and it, it just became this very interesting character. So yeah, um, that's some awesome, awesome advice that you guys all got and gave. I'm going to jump in right to that kind of the meat and potatoes. Obviously personal preference will never end. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I judge for a film festival and I judge the, the screenplays and um, sometimes I'll get a script and I'll just be like, it just, it's just not, I'm just not feeling it. It's just not interesting to me. I think that there's things wrong with it. And then the next thing I know, I see that script on the award nomination list. And I'm like, I mean, it's a panel of judges. I'm just one voice on the judge. Lucky for that writer. Um, but I've <laughs> been scripts where I'm like, this, I'm like, this could be an Oscar winning feature. This is amazing. Oh my, and it blows my mind. And then like, it's not on the nomination list. And I'm like messaging the festival director. I'm like, how is that script not nominated? It was amazing. So um, I feel like the question, what makes a good story is a little bit of a either a trick question or an unanswerable question. But I feel like there are things that speak to audiences that become more interesting. So I guess really quick, if you just want to go down the line, what would you say make something a, a good story after i said how it can't be answered no, we're no, <laughs> yeah no, you go down, down the line there, i'll go down the line <laughs> uh, my first yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i i love irony so much i just find it so interesting always in in stories so it's one of my favorites that i usually kind of am interested in if i get to learn something and along the line too there you go. I'm in. <laughs> Sweet. Nick? Uh, yeah, an unanswerable question. Um, I think, well, that's like the cardinal rule, right? Like the only rule that really matters is, is it interesting? Don't make anything boring. Like it shouldn't be boring. It's got to be interesting. But what does that mean? If you've got mm -hmm. terrible taste, maybe you find boring things interesting. And I can't help you with that. Like that's sometimes that's just what you have to deal with. But I think it's a matter of if you've created an interesting character and put them in interesting situations, interesting things will happen. But trying to make it interesting, trying to shoehorn being like too clever, like in a way that feels like you're trying, like you could see the strings. I think mm -hmm. that's uh, where you shoot yourself in the foot. I think the best situations come from the character that are true to the character and they aren't you trying to force something interesting on it because 
it's like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the audience. I write a lot of comedy and that's, I think that really kind of shows up when you're like, oh, isn't this a witty line? People are going to pat me on the back. It's like, well, not necessarily. It's probably people aren't going to respond the way you think in your own head. So yeah, they're interesting characters, put them in interesting situations and in interesting settings. I will say, um, I remember one piece of advice you gave me when I was first starting out in writing and you said that the story has to move, not like formulaically, but like, especially if it's a drama, but even if it's just any type of story, if the character comes in and they're angry, maybe have the scene end where they're sad or they're happy or they're more angry. If right. they come in and they're bored, maybe now they're crying. Now, you know, like, like have there be some sort of dynamic movement Yes. Not just within the beginning, middle, and end, but every, and not like every scene has to move, but if you have that motion of character where there's change happening, like microscope, what is it on like a micro and a macro level? Right. Like both of those things. That yeah, was exactly. That you gave me. Yeah, it's true. Like it has to move and every scene has to exist for a reason. Like right. just putting scenes in because you know you have to put a scene there. It's like, well, why does a scene exist? And if so, if it's not, it doesn't exist to move the story forward and the character yeah. to continue on a journey, it just needs to go or needs to change into something else. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Applause. Um, Sarah, you write some of the most interesting and different like not even like macabre, but like beautiful fantasy pieces. How does your mind work? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what for you makes something like a good story? Um, I mean, there's there's a hundred different ways you can approach it, of course. But I think fundamentally, if you've got an interesting character or characters that you care about, that doesn't mean that you like them necessarily, but that you care about their plight at least and put them basically in increasingly impossible situations, mounting conflict mm -hmm. um, to the point where it seems like there's no possible way that they can get through this or survive this or get what they want. That is fundamentally the basis of every good Lord. story, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nora, you mentioned uh, so what <laughs> um, being a baseline. And it's true, it's, it's very true, you know, I, I feel that way about many pitches that I get. I want them to tell me, so what, you know, okay, great. Here's the thing. Why, why, why is this story important? What makes this interesting? But I, I think I, I, listening to everybody, I, I, and Sarah, it's like you, you get your characters up a tree, you throw rocks at them and see if they can come down. Like there's a saying, but I, if I had to answer that question, I'm going to answer that question, which is unanswerable. I'd say you want the viewer reader to want to know what's going to happen. Like the key to a good story is it's, so it's a little different for writing than film, obviously, because in writing, what could drive the story is just beautiful writing. It could just be the language. It could be so beautifully written that you just want to keep reading, but you, you want to find out what's going to happen. So I think a good story has to have a driving narrative. So I can't put down this book until I know what's going to happen. I can't walk away from this movie. I can put it on pause, you know, now, but I have to see the end. And I, I think that when that happens, you've got a great story. And, it, you know, if somebody says to me, I couldn't put it down, I'm like, oh, that's all I care about. You know, uh, that's that's the best compliment. So, you know, that that would be my I think everybody in conjunction, everybody's answer is works really well together. Yeah, no, I agree. You made me realize that I think the biggest insult I've ever gotten on a script was, I'm sorry, I just haven't finished reading it yet. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I was like, okay. Yes, yes. It's so, yes. I, like, I, I got a rejection once uh, in, when those days you mailed them in on paper. And oh, then yeah. they came back in a self-addressed stamp envelope. And someone must have had a pencil in their hand or a pen. And it was stuck in the middle of my manuscript. Like they had just left a pen in there. I guess they said, stop reading at some point, put it down, shoved it back in the envelope. And I, I was like, oh my God. So I hear you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so, okay, oh dear. <laughs> no, I think those are, are fantastic and, and hopefully useful um, answers to the audience. Hey guys, it's Spacey, and that's the end of part one of our Patreon writers panel. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash spacestreamfilms, but you'll be able to hear this in full in part two. So yeah, that'll be exciting. And uh, yeah, as thanks as always for, for tuning in, it means a lot to both of us. 
And uh, that's it for now. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to Filmmaking Actually with Cora Linda, Space Dream Productions podcast. Subscribe to us on any or all the podcast platforms, but we especially recommend our sponsor, Anchor. If you like what you hear, leave us five-star ratings and positive reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. It helps more listeners like you discover the show. But the best thing you can do if you really like the show is tell a friend. Want to leave a comment or ask a question? Email at filmmakingactually at gmail. Dot com. This is Spacey speaking, and remember, The Grapes of Wrath was a book turned into a movie. The Wrath of Grapes is a hangover turned into a joke for this podcast, and we'll see you next time.